Today on Timescast, the conflict raging in Syria will take center stage at the United Nations behind me this week as more than 120 presidents, kings, and other world leaders gather for the annual general debate. It is obviously not the only issue that will be discussed here. There is also the problem of Al-Qaeda spreading across the Western Sahara, the slow negotiations over Iran's nuclear program, poverty issues like the drop in aid around the world, the fight in Asia over small, mineral-rich islands, and also the recent spate of riots around the world prompted by religious intolerance. Many of those took place in Arab countries that had recently experienced a political transition. So the leaders of Egypt, Yemen, Tunisia, and Libya, who will be speaking here for the first time, will gather a lot of attention. My colleague David Kirkpatrick in Cairo had the chance to speak with Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi before he arrived here. A colleague and I had a chance this week to interview President Mohamed Morsi, the new Islamist leader of Egypt, on the occasion of his first trip as president to the United States for the United Nations. He had a very firm message he wanted to deliver to the U.S. I think, I think what I'm trying now, seriously, uh, looking to the future and see that we are real friends. He also made it very clear that the U.S. should not expect the kind of easy compliance that they did under former President Hosni Mubarak. He I insisted that I if the U.S. wanted to end decades of hatred from the Arab world, it was the responsibility of Washington and the United States to change its policies towards the region, beginning with a greater respect for Arab culture, even when it conflicts with Western values, an obvious allusion to the greater respect for Sharia and Islamic law here in Egypt, but also on the subject of, of Israel and the Palestinians. The United States uh, has pressed Egypt firmly to stand by its commitments to Israel under the Camp David Treaty, President Morsi said it was also time for the United States to fulfill what he said were its obligations under the 1978 Camp David Accord, which the U.S. signed, and called for a full withdrawal of Israeli troops from Gaza and the West Bank to make room for a Palestinian statehood. I tried to press President Morsi on where he fit in in the spectrum of conservative Islamists here in Egypt and around the region. I asked him about his statements years ago on behalf of the Muslim Brotherhood's political wing about whether or not it would be appropriate for a woman or a Christian to be Egypt's president. His answer was interesting. It came in three parts. First, he said again that it was wrong for the United States to accept Egypt to, to live by American uh, norms and values. Then he said it was a matter of Islamic law and it was up to Muslim scholars to decide uh, whether a Christian or a, or a woman would be qualified to be Egypt's president. But finally, he said, I will not prevent a woman to be uh, nominated as a candidate for the presidential campaign. This is not in the Constitution. This is not in the law. But you want to ask me will I vote for her or not, that's something else. President Morsi initially sought to meet with President Barack Obama at the White House while he's in, in the United States, but received a cool reception and quickly backed down. President Morsi understands he's treading into a very sensitive time in U.S. election year politics. It'll be interesting to see how the first Islamist president of Egypt is received. That was my colleague David Kirkpatrick in Cairo previewing President Morsi's speech on Wednesday here. Of course, even though Syria will take center stage, attention doesn't equal solutions at the United Nations. And Syria has two important backers here, Russia and China. And diplomats say the United Nations are returning to sort of its old Cold War form, where once an issue comes under the wing of a great power, it's very hard to find a solution here. So as one diplomat said, although everyone will talk about Syria and it will be the focus of a lot of speeches, nobody is expecting any new initiatives. In fact, President Obama, since he's wrestling with a difficult election campaign, is practicing something like drive-by diplomacy. He's hosting a party for many of the world leaders on Monday night and giving his traditional speech at the opening session on Tuesday, but he's not meeting with any solo leaders, choosing instead to go up here on the ABC program The View once he's done here. For many years now, President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad of Iran has captured a lot of attention here by bashing Israel and kind of mocking the foreign policy of the United States. This is expected to be his last appearance at the United Nations General Assembly as there's a presidential election next year in Iran. And there's a new diplomatic star at the other end of the spectrum, Dao Aung San Suu Kyi, 
the opposition leader from Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, will be making her first appearance here since years of detention ended with her election to parliament. Of course, amidst all the speeches and negotiations, there's also a lot of fun that goes on, a lot of shopping and parties. And President Evo Morales has put together a Bolivian soccer team that is challenging a team from the United Nations, hoping to raise money for the programs on violence against women. Thank you.